Hello and welcome to Executive Session, a general election debate between incumbent Republican Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt and Democratic Challenger, State Superintendent for Public Instruction, Joy Hoffmeister. Let's welcome our candidates to the stage right now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, audience. That's one of your chances to clap. My name is Trace Savage. I'm the editor-in-chief of nondoc.com. We're an independent journalism publication based here in Oklahoma. Thank you so much. We're a nonprofit. There's donation stickers at the door. And I'm here to moderate this debate tonight at the Will Rogers Theater in Oklahoma City with News 9's Storm Jones. News 9 is streaming the debate tonight live on News9.com, NewsOn6.com, and the Facebook pages of News 9, Nondoc, and other media partners such as The Frontier. The Frontier will be leading a fact check effort after tonight's debate. We also want to wish those around the country welcome to Oklahoma from C-SPAN. Uh, Trace thought our national audience tonight would be a good time to tell folks neither of us rode horses uh, to school. So. <laughs> but we might ask the candidates about teeth floating later, so be prepared. Okay, some people will get that, some people won't. Uh, this is our 10th time moderating a debate this year, Storm, so thank you so much for supporting public debates in the state of Oklahoma. You know who else has supported our 2022 public debate series? The State Chamber of Oklahoma. They're our presenting sponsor tonight. Thank you all so much for believing in public debates and believing that the public is well heard, uh, well served by hearing their candidates. Now we just got word C-SPAN's live, okay. So, uh, for those of you who tolerate politicians better with a beverage in your hand, you should thank the Hillary Communications Company and Fowler Automotive Group. They're our bar sponsors tonight, as well as sponsors of independent journalism. Uh, I've got a few other sponsors to thank for our 2022 debate series, AARP Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Public School Resource Center, the advocacy firm of McSpadden, Milner & Robinson, Oklahoma Association of Realtors, and Overman Legal Group. Thank you so much for believing in public debates. And if you're watching at the Tulsa Press Club in the state, in the state, in the city of Tulsa, uh, thank you to the Oklahoma Policy Institute and the Grand River Dam Authority for making that watch party possible. Okay, Storm. Just a few more announcements. We're getting close. We are in public, so please remember to silence your phones. But while you have your phones out, go ahead and share that News 9 stream so your neighbors can be as informed as you are for being here tonight. We also want to remind you that the November 8 ballot will feature two other gubernatorial candidates, Libertarian Natalie Bruno and Independent Irvin Yin. Both have been polling uh, below 5%, so we have to devote our time this evening to the two leading candidates for this important office. Quick rules for the audience. Please hold your applause until the end of each round of questions, and please be respectful. Don't shout things, don't scream, don't be a jerk. I will ask security to get you out of here. I'll clear this room so we can keep this debate going for the thousands of people watching, but we can avoid doing that, right, Storm? Surely we can. Here's tonight's format. Each candidate will have 90 seconds for an opening statement, then we'll have three rounds of questions before a 90-second closing. We flipped a coin earlier to see the order of opening and closing statements. Governor Stitt, you'll go first in opening statements. Superintendent Hoffmeister, you'll go second. Governor Stitt, 90 seconds. The stage is yours. Well, first off, thank you so much for joining us online and all those in the audience. You know, I like to remind people how far we've come in the last four years. You know, we've gone from budget deficits to a record savings account, from four-day school weeks and teacher walkouts to now the largest investment in education and teachers in the history of our state a brightest economy with the lowest unemployment we've ever had. Folks, Oklahoma's turnaround, it is working. We simply can't go backwards, and we know what will happen if we put Biden's party back in charge. You know, I think about Americans who are struggling with high inflation. The Biden party, they want tax hikes. Meanwhile, in Oklahoma, I cut taxes for every single Oklahoman, every single business, and I want to eliminate the grocery tax. You know, when I think about people just struggling to keep the lights on, Biden's administration, they're begging OPEC and Russia to produce more oil. Meanwhile, in Oklahoma, we're protecting oil and gas jobs to have most of the affordable energy in the entire country. And when people just want safe communities and families, you know, the Biden party is defunding the police. Meanwhile, in Oklahoma, we back the blue. I gave our law enforcement a 30% increase this year 
the largest they had ever had in the last decade. Folks, Oklahoma's turnaround is working. We cannot go backwards. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Superintendent Hoffmeister, 90-second opening statement to you. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you, and I am grateful for Governor Stitt coming uh, for this debate, and all of those who have joined us today. This is important to have public debate. Thank you for hosting. Uh, my husband, Jerry, and I, uh, we've been married almost 38 years. We have four grown children, and just nine months ago, welcomed our first grandbaby. And as we raise our kids, we raise them with uh, the same values that most Oklahomans hold dear. Uh, we value faith, family, education, hard work. And we know that it takes working together uh, in order to see our economy thrive. Uh, we know it means that we've got to have a community uh, where we put world-class schools at the top. Uh, where we have access to quality, affordable health care and safe communities, and where we are also prioritizing the infrastructure for great jobs in this state. I'm the daughter of an electrician, uh, and my grandfather was an electrician. And it was that hard work that my dad did that inspired me to put education first. I was also that kid who struggled to read. Uh, I went to college, the first in my family, I stepped out of college, got married, put my husband through Baptist Seminary, and we work together to overcome a, a lot of challenges, but we know that for Oklahoma to flourish, we've got to get back to common sense, respect for one another, working together, and getting things done. Thank you very much. Let's get to our first round of questions. I thought there might be a little bit. We'll, we'll hold the rest of the applause until they ask each question. Trust me, it goes better that way. Our first round of questions tonight is titled, A Relaxing Run for Governor. Uh, each question will uh, offer one minute to each candidate to answer. We will mostly alternate who answers each question first. Storm, you've got a toss-up. Yeah, this first question is going to be a toss-up. I'm sure it's going to be the most difficult question of the evening. When Governor Brad Henry was in office, he honed his skills as a painter. When she was governor, Mary Fallon would ride her motorcycle around the mansion grounds. This is a stressful job you're both seeking. So tell us what hobby or activity helps you relax. 30 seconds, whoever wants to go first. Well, as a, as a father of, of six, you know, most of my time is spent with chasing kids around at different sporting events and my sixth graders playing football. So go Huskies for all them watching out there. Uh, I've got a ninth grader that plays volleyball. And so really just like most, most dads right now, juggling your job and then also uh, being a good parent and following your kids around. I love doing that. And then Trying to work in a date night with my, with my wife is important. Thanks for being here, Sarah. It's usually dragging her to a campaign barbecue this time of the year. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun being a dad and a parent and, uh, and really serving Oklahoma. Thank you. Superintendent? Oh, that's an, that's an easy one. Uh, I love to spend time uh, with our new grandbaby, Willa. And uh, actually, you know, she's part of the motivation uh, that keeps fueling me. And every time we think about what we are going to do for the future of this state, we think about uh, our kids. And uh, my husband and I have enjoyed hikes all over the state and state parks, uh, as well as um, actually traveling um, many, many miles all over the state talking with Oklahomans. Uh, I've got 500,000 miles on my car to prove it, too. Wonderful. Uh, Governor, I've got the first question for you. You campaigned for office in 2018 on making Oklahoma a top 10 state. I think everybody's heard that. But four years later, we remain ranked around the bottom 10 in states on key education and health care issues. As you make your case for re-election, tell us specifically where have you moved the needle the most on making Oklahoma top 10, and where have you been unable to move that needle? Well, thank you. You know, as, as a leader and governor, and whether you're CEO, uh, you have to set a vision for all of your employees and for all the state. So being top 10 is an aspirational goal. It's something that we're never going to hit, but it directs us in that we live in the greatest state in the country. The American dream is alive and well in Oklahoma. For a kid that went to first grade in Wayne, Oklahoma, graduated from Norman High School, you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. So that vision is what I focus on. Uh, but we're, we're number, uh, number one in most affordable electricity. We're number five in bridge conditions. Uh, we were number 50th, the last place when I took over. 
uh, in incarceration rates. That's something I'm very proud of. I've moved the needle, closed two private prisons, saving the taxpayer dollars, and, but also giving people second chances. Uh, but you know, you bring up a really good question. Education is something that everybody, that's what we want for our kids. Everybody out there wants that. What my opponent needs to answer is, why are we 49th in education right now? Well, I've got that question right here. You've got that woe sign. Take a, take a look at that. Superintendent Hoffmeister, he led into it. I mentioned education rankings not being where anyone wants them to be. You've been state superintendent for eight years. Where specifically have you moved the needle most, and where have you been unable to move that needle? Oh, I appreciate this question, and you're right. Uh, Oklahoma is woefully prepared for the future in education because we do not have the people on the team to meet the needs of students. Oklahoma has a teacher shortage that leads the nation. Um, when I first stepped into office, I asked for uh, competitive pay to attract teachers, and we got that after three years. But what we realize, too, is that there needs to be more people on the team, school counselors, reading specialists, paraprofessionals. We are losing those people to other states and other industries. And we did raise our academic expectations, our standards, and now they moved from a D minus to an A rating. But you can have the highest standards in the world, and if you don't have the teachers to teach them, what good is it? Here's the problem. This governor has a school voucher scheme that is a rural school killer. You kill the school, you it's kill the community. Governor, 15 second rebuttal. We're gonna to get to all that in a little bit. Do you wanna say anything right now? Well, you know, the, the 15 seconds. here's the facts. Um, you know, the facts are this, uh, my opponent has received a billion dollars in new spending over the last eight years. The only thing that hasn't improved is education. Uh, so really the people out there, uh, Superintendent, wanna know you know, why, have your, why has your record gone downhill uh, in education outcomes since you've been, go, since you've been uh, superintendent? Final 15 seconds to close us out. Because we need a governor who gets it. We need a governor who understands the connection between people, teachers who are trained, resourced, and ready on day one to meet the needs of children who have very um, in incredibly deep needs today. And we'll talk more about what those are and how to solve it. Absolutely, we will. Storm, you have the next question. All right, this 60 seconds uh, starts with Superintendent Hoffmeister. Let's go back in time 18 months. You're both statewide elected Republican officials serving together on executive boards. Superintendent Hoffmeister, a lot of folks were surprised when you announced that you were switching parties to challenge Governor Stitt as a Democrat. What specifically drove you to switch parties and run in this campaign? Well, that's easy. Um, our governor hijacked the Republican Party. Uh, he is driving our state into the ground. I am aggressively moderate, always have been, and I believe in bringing people together, not what our governor has done, which is sowing chaos and division, pitting neighbor against neighbor. Uh, we need to move forward, and there's a lot on the line. And as I view this state, we realize that we are not seeing a governor whose vision includes building the robust world-class schools that are needed. We don't have a governor who has put the access to health care for all patients in this state in place. Instead, what he has done, once, he wants to privatize. He wants to take away the freedom of Oklahomans to make their health care decisions, those medical care decisions with their trusted doctor. And it is harming the opportunities for the kind of state that has the workforce to build a robust economy. Governor, we're going to let you respond to that, but I do want to drill down on this for just a second. I think a lot of folks on both sides of the aisle um, want to know, State Superintendent, if, if you're a Democrat, the, the Democratic Party in the state has a 94-page party platform. How much of that do you subscribe to? I'm an independent thinker. I am running as an Oklahoman. And I'm on one team, and that's Team Oklahoma. I stand here today representing Oklahoma families regardless of their party affiliation. And I will also say that I was a Republican longer than Governor Stitt was registered to vote. Governor Stitt, 60 seconds. When did you get a sense that uh, Mrs. Hoffmeister was displeased with your job and, and going to participate in this race? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna, those people that are sitting at their table right now and, and we're getting into these things, here's the facts. We have the largest savings account in our state's history. I cut taxes for every single Oklahoman. 
We want to eliminate the grocery tax. We've been holding government accountable. We believe in small government, lower taxes. Uh, my opponent, she couldn't see a path forward for herself as a Republican, so she switched parties. She joined Biden's party, which canceled the Keystone Pipeline day one in office. They believe in open borders. She's never saw a tax they didn't like and want to spend your taxpayer dollars. So folks, the turnaround is working. We have an awesome state. We are so much better off four years uh, today than we were four years ago. We want to keep this momentum going. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to these candidates so far. Those of you who, those of you who know me means that you know that we must be having a little bit of a technical issue with the video feed. I'm going to take a drink of water, Storm. You want to take a drink of water as well? This is a good time for you to share that stream again as we work that kink out. Just one second. Mmm, delicious Aquafina water. Did I mention that Hillary Communications and Fowler Auto Group have sponsored that bar? So feel free if you need to get another beverage. I'm going to jump back into it. I hope we've gotten that worked out. They will let me know if we haven't, and we'll make sure that the people watching at home can see this awesome debate. Okay, Storm, where were yeah. we? So this 60-second uh, question will start with Governor Stitt. You spent a great deal of time trying to recruit major companies to move to Oklahoma, but one of the challenges facing our state and the entire country involves the workforce. Many industries are struggling to find qualified job applicants and companies and often speak of a skills gap in the hiring market. Simply put, mu what must be done to improve the situation for Oklahoma students and employers alike? Thank you. You know, we have to break down the silos between higher ed, common ed, and career tech. We need one workforce person that can get everyone aligned. Uh, and to me, it's pretty simple. Let's look at the jobs of tomorrow. What are the companies? What do they need? And then let's make sure we get that workforce ready. We need more engineers. We need more doctors and lawyers. But we also need more AMP mechanics and HVAC techs and more nurses. And so I'm constantly working with higher ed to focus on that workforce of tomorrow. One, one exciting thing that's happening in Norman, Oklahoma, is we just set up an aviation program. We are thinking outside the box, folks. So a high school student, if they want to become an AMP mechanic, and by the way, just for all the young people working out there, American Airlines is hiring. It's $70,000 a year for a starting salary. So you can go to this high school. By the time you graduate, you're 90% there to an AP mechanic. We have to think outside the box, and we can't keep doing the same things we've done for the Thank last you. eight years. Uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister, what can be done to narrow that skills gap? Well, this is the reason I'm running, because we absolutely are missing out on opportunities for uh, industry leaders to come to Oklahoma, but also to keep people here. We've got to build a long-term plan, which is going to actually build capacity for our state. What the governor has done is focused on short-term gains, uh, a Panasonic deal, $700 million. Uh, a lot of enthusiasm around that. I'm not against uh, an incentive that makes sense with a high return on investment. But if we're going to look long-term, we have got to support our kids. They've got to have a competitive education. We can't dismantle public education, which is going to happen under the governor's watch. And we've got to make sure that Oklahomans have access to quality, affordable health care and that we do nothing to prevent the health decisions that should be made between a patient, an Oklahoman, and their doctor. Finally, I want to say we need a governor who can close a deal. All right? We need a governor who gets the connection with education and that will put Oklahomans first. The only business that is thriving under Governor Stitt's watch is his own. Yeah, Governor, 30 seconds. 15 seconds. Here's the deal. I know the truth. She's not lying to me. She's lying to you, the public. Uh, we have the lowest unemployment in our state's history. Uh, we have uh, an economy that is growing. Right now, Oklahoma is number 11 in the country, 11th in migration, people moving to the great state of Oklahoma because of our pro-business, pro-freedom policies. We don't want to put Biden's party back in control of Oklahoma of higher taxes and more regulation. Superintendent, 30 seconds if you'd like it. Yeah, the governor keeps talking about people out of this state. Uh, this, is, this is the practice. He reads off a national script and is out of touch with Oklahomans and the actual needs and solutions that are right here if we will work with stakeholders and those experts here in Oklahoma. Uh, 
I also know that he's taking credit for the largest saving ca savings account, uh, yet he didn't sign the budget. Uh, he said he inhaled a press conference and said because he didn't have anything to do with that. So it's, it's a convenient today, 20 days before election, to talk about that. All right, 15 more seconds, then we'll, we'll move on. Again, uh, to everybody out there at your kitchen table, uh, we've gone from budget nightmares, almost zero money in savings, and you elected a business person. You wanted an outsider, not a career politician, to put a fresh set of eyes on every contract and hold government accountable. That's exactly what I'm doing for you. We've got the largest savings account in state history, the lowest unemployment. We cut taxes last year, and we're going to continue that momentum. Thank you. 15 seconds, Superintendent, if you want it. Well, yeah. Um, first of all, I would just say that um, the governor talks about um, that we have low unemployment. But I want to tell you about conversations I've had with people, a woman in Tulsa, Four kids, she's working three jobs. And she said home ownership is going to be out of reach for her. She can't imagine how she will ever afford it. It matters about the quality of jobs we have. And in order to be ready for that, we've got to have the education and the health to do it. Thank you very much. I thought this was going to be a round called a relaxing run for governor, but who knows. Uh, let's see if we get there on this question. A lot of people thought they would be voting on state question 820 this year, which proposes decriminalizing marijuana in Oklahoma. Uh, delays in the, uh, it, the new validation process. I don't, some people would be mad at me if I said delays, but uh, delays in getting this validated means it won't be on the November 8th ballot, but yesterday Governor Stitt set a March 7th special election for the question. So we're curious, uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister, 60 seconds to you. Will you support or oppose SQ 820 if you are elected governor? And let's go ahead and ask, have you ever smoked marijuana or consumed cannabis? The answer to your last question is no. However, uh, it depends on who's governor. Well, if you're governor, because are we you... Have seen, no, not whether or not I'm going to s smoke. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I get you. Okay. Whether or not I support this depends on who's governor, because frankly, this governor, we saw the mess that was made. It's a wild, wild west with medical marijuana, with uh, 8,500 dispensaries, with uh, a governor who, at the same election, took the mantle of that office and failed to lead to put those guardrails in place and to contain the medical marijuana uh, industry. We have good growers, we have bad growers. I was talking with some DEA agents in a diner on Main Street in rural Oklahoma and I asked them, is it true? Do we have Russian and Chinese mafia in Oklahoma? And they said yes. That's on his watch. And also, I would also just have to say to you that if you think this governor, with all the scandals and what we have seen, is going to be able to have a safe and not a corrupt recreational adult use marijuana system, then you are smoking something. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna light one up and then just pause for a minute. We lost, we lost, he didn't smile about that. We lost our video feed for just a second and Governor, you're gonna get a second to think about this because I'm gonna come back to her and then you, I'm gonna need to know when we're back up. We're switched, we're, I got the keep going word. So just real quick, Superintendent Hoffmeister, the question was, if you are elected governor, will you support state question 820 on the March ballot? You know, I'm not certain yet, because part of that answer, I do think that it is something that, uh, we basically have recreational marijuana today, but we don't have the tax income. So that's very attractive uh, to have the ability to um, actually have some revenue that would help education and some other needed areas. But what I'm most worried about is cleaning up the mess that's been left uh, under Governor Stitt's watch. In fact, not only under his watch, uh, but under his nose. Uh, his own appointee uh, is helping Chinese business says smuggle drugs right here <laughs> in the state. Um, we, we know that this is a serious crisis. Go talk with anyone in rural Oklahoma. In fact, I was talking with Western far, um, uh, farmers and ranchers about this very issue. Let me let him get his answer in. Thank you very much. Governor, uh, let me remind you of the question. If you're reelected in November, will you support or oppose SQ820 in March? And have you ever consumed cannabis? Are we talking about medical or recreational? Uh, either way. The, the, whatever form you so would like to, to have the, it to, in. To the, people, to the people out there uh, that are actually watching at home and, and concerned about this issue, it is a real mess. When I first became governor, 
Uh, it was a poorly worded referendum, and this industry popped up overnight, medical marijuana industry. So we passed nine different, no, no, I think 12 different laws last year to address it. We spun the agency out. We hired 80 new enforcement agents. Uh, we have a moratorium. So I heard from rural Oklahoma with all the foreign nationals buying up farmland and ranch land, we put a moratorium. There's no more new licenses till we get control of this industry. We also are one of only 14 states that we passed. It's illegal for a foreign national to own farmland in Oklahoma. So we're doing drug bust. We are enforcing that. We are going to get control of that industry uh, before we ever talk about the recreational piece. Well, let me just ask you, though. If you, so are you saying that if you don't get that under control, you won't support it or you will support it? Yeah. What is your position no, in March? I'll be, look, sorry, I will be very clear. No, I am not supporting that. It is still illegal federally. We should not have a checkered board of jurisdictions across the state, so I am not supporting recreational marijuana. I'm not sure, again, what my opponent is saying. She's been spinning this in a circle like a politician, but I think Oklahomans want to know what her answer is on this issue. Well, let me ask you real quick, have you, with the, the medical question, have you consumed it? Ever? Once? Nobody's mad. My, my parents are in the room, so they're going to be very disappointed, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Storm, you've got a question about turnpikes, I believe. Uh, we're a little bit behind, but this is a great conversation. Storm, you're up. Okay. Pulling the turnpike question. Um, by the, this way, will by be... the way, I would want to yes. just say, I do think it should be on the ballot. The people should have the opportunity to have their voices heard, okay. and I will respect the will of the people, but we will do this in a way that is safe and that gets control again over uh, the kind of Wild West that we're in today. All right. Storm. Uh, Governor Stitt, earlier this year you announced a massive expansion of turnpikes in Oklahoma aimed at reducing traffic congestion. The plan is expected to cost about $5 billion over 15 years, and it's aggravated some citizens who will be displaced from their homes or have a loud turnpike in their proverbial backyard. What do you say to those Oklahomans whose lives are being upended for new toll roads? Well, we want to be top 10 at everything we do, and that includes roads and bridges. And staying ahead of infrastructure and congestion is a huge advantage for Oklahoma right now. We've gone from 47th in bridge conditions with our hardworking folks in that sector, and now we're number five. Everybody remembers in here in 2002 when we had the bridge collapse uh, happen. Uh, 14 people lost their lives. Infrastructure is so, so important. We're focused on rural infrastructure. Uh, we, we, want, we want rural roads. I went to Washington, D.C. to make sure we got some funding for our rural highways, to put shoulders on all of our rural highways. So I'm an infrastructure governor. There's no doubt about it. And, but we're going to accommodate every single person that we can as they're laying out routes and there's engineering. So there's in comment periods right now. Uh, but we can't have gridlock. And what you're going to hear my opponent say is she wants to cancel it. Uh, and apparently she wants gridlock on I-35 uh, for the next 50 years. But leaders have to lead, and we have an obligation to make sure that Oklahoma is, 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 is well positioned for the growth and the momentum that we have going for all of our citizens. Superintendent Hoffmeister, are you in favor of this turnpike expansion? I am not in favor of the southern extension that was not part of what was established with the authority uh, through the legislature. Uh, so this is something mm -hmm. that I have sat in the living rooms of uh, those in um, Norman who are in the path of this, 600, over 600 homes. They are um, needing answers. So I think part of what we have to do is reform. Uh, we need intimate domain reform. Uh, we need to have uh, the Open Meetings Act uh, to apply to the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority, and I am calling for the state auditor to do the first ever external uh, state audit of the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority. Uh, 70, 75 years, that hasn't happened, and it needs to. Also, the two-lane roads uh, all across the state are where the deaths occur. These are killers, and instead of working to support safer roads all across the state, uh, this governor has been dug in, and the way that the communities found out was when it uh, broke on social media. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. We need a modern infrastructure for the future, and we don't have it today. Thank you very much. We, uh, something's ringing. Well, that's the end of round one of questions. Give them a round of applause.
Our second round of questions tonight is titled The Kitchen Sink because we're going to throw a lot of things at them. Uh, we're going to have a slew of questions on prominent issues in civic discourse. Buckle up, Storm. This is a 60-second question. Superintendent Hoffmeister first. Extreme drought and other weather events are becoming more common or being blamed on climate change, which societies across the globe have recognized as a scientific consensus. Many people acknowledge how human activity that releases carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases contributes to climate change. The question, do you agree with that statement and do you agree with the Oklahoma Democratic Party platform which supports dramatic and bold actions be taken on a worldwide basis to reduce carbon emissions? 60 seconds. There's nothing that defines the quality of life more than energy. Uh, we need more energy, not less. And frankly, there is no such thing as good energy or bad energy, clean energy or, or, or not. Uh, we have zero emissions that people talk about, which we know is not true. Uh, there are zero emission cars, they claim, but they have emissions when they're built, when they're transported, when they're shipped. Uh, there's nothing clean about not having energy 24-7. Ask a hospital last year. Ask a homeowner last year during that winter storm or polar vortex when our grid did not, uh, barely made it and we saw an uh, increased need to use gas because uh, our homes uh, were without electricity and we did not have the ability um, to power this state with the right fuel during that storm. We need, and I'm, I'm critical, frankly, of this governor. I'm critical of Joe Biden. They haven't done enough to battle uh, the needs of Oklahoma and the energy industry, and I will never turn my back on Oklahoma's energy industry, and I am not in favor of raising any taxes. In fact, I've called for a reduction of the fuel tax, and this governor didn't. Governor, 60 seconds. Do you agree with the statement that human activity is causing climate change, and how do you balance that with the state so reliant on petroleum for jobs and economic activity? You know, first off, climate is, is always changing. What I'll brag about Oklahoma is we've reduced our admissions three times the national average since 2005 from President Biden's own benchmark. It is clean burning natural gas uh, that is leading to that. So the attack from the Biden administration, her party on Oklahoma oil and gas is just unbelievable. Every single president of the United States since 1973 has had an energy independence policy. She joined this party and day one in office, the same year she joined, they killed the Keystone Pipeline. That's what's causing inflation numbers to go up. That's why we're paying so much money at the gas pump. Oklahoma has an all of the above, more of everything approach. We're number two in wind energy. I've signed an MOU with the governor of Arkansas and Louisiana to get a hydrogen hub right here in Oklahoma. So folks, our energy grid, we're a net exporter and we're one of only four states that can say this, one of only four states can say that over 40% of our energy comes from renewables. So I'm so proud of the Oklahoma story. I tell it all the time. You should Thank be you. very proud of it. And it's leading to huge economic uh, uh, events here with manufacturing Thank want to move Governor. here because of our reliable energy grid, something we're really proud of in Oklahoma. Superintendent Hoffmeister, we'll give you 15 seconds. Yeah, thank you. American energy independence is American safety and security. Evidently, he reads off national scripts. I don't. I'm an independent thinker. I don't care what someone else has written or stands for. I am standing for the people of this state. I'm on one team, Team Oklahoma. And the energy sector is an incredibly important part of our economy, jobs, and the people of this state need those jobs. This governor has, uh, on his watch, we still have hundreds of wells that are offline. We can do more. He does not have a comprehensive energy plan. And we Thank should you. have it, and we will. Uh, we only have, with this governor, 70 pages of pictures uh, about Thank fracking. You. Governor, uh, 15 more seconds on energy before we move on. Well, I, I guess she wants government intervention and in everything. I think our oil and gas companies do a fantastic job. We're, we're number four in the country in oil production, number three in natural gas production. So uh, I'm actually not sure exactly what she just said, but I support our oil and gas industry. We've got a thriving industry, and as well as our renewables. I can, we can talk about both, and we're not having honest conversations, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, if you're not talking about 
the need for oil and natural gas, and also the move to renewables. I'm going after hard after uh, battery companies, and, and we're going after electric vehicle companies. We have more charging stations per capita in Oklahoma than any other state. Oklahoma, Oklahomans out there, we have a fantastic state. The momentum is building. We've got to keep it going. Thank you very much. I'm going to point you both to that octagonal woe sign and just kind of try to keep that in mind. Finish your thought when you see it from the young man up front. Uh, Governor Stitt, we're switching to another topic. Nearly one year ago, hours before a man named Julius Jones was scheduled to die from lethal injection, you commuted his sentence to, de uh, to life without the possibility of parole. Jones was convicted of murdering Edmund resident Paul Howell during a 1999 carjacking. A documentary questioned Jones' guilt, but prosecutors insist he was rightfully convicted. Your official statement made uh, about your decision was that, quote, after prayerful consideration and reviewing materials presented by all sides of this case, you commuted the sentence. Tonight, can you be more specific about why you commuted that sentence? Do you believe Julius Jones was wrongly convicted? You know, when, when you take the oath of office as governor, you promise to obey, we promise to defend, we promise to uh, enforce all the laws uh, in the state of Oklahoma. And the death penalty is uh, probably the most surreal thing that you can do as, as, as a governor. So we have a process that we put in place. I spoke with all the previous governors about their process. Uh, we met with the defense attorneys, we met with the prosecutors, I met with the, the Howe family, and I felt like after hearing all that information, that was the best decision for uh, the state of Oklahoma. Do you think he was wrongfully convicted? Why did you think that was the best decision? Well, I'm, I'm not going to get into, uh, I'm not the jury, I didn't see all the evidence, uh, but that was the best decision for the state of Oklahoma. S Superintendent Howe, I, I question whether I want to push back or ask you a third time, but uh, You'll get I know the same what I answer. think. I'll get the same answer. I know what I think you told the Howell family. Are you willing to say that here? No, you tell it. You, I, I, it was not my story to tell. I didn't have their permission to do so. Uh, okay, Superintendent Hoffmeister, beyond Julius Jones, Governor Stitt has denied commutations to a half dozen other death row inmates, even when the Pardon and Parole Board has recommended leniency. Tomorrow morning, Benjamin Cole, who the board did not, uh, for whom the board did not recommend clemency, uh, is scheduled to be executed for killing a nine-month-old baby. The Oklahoma Democratic Party's official platform calls for, quote, an end to the death penalty. Many of your supporters hope that you will discontinue the practice of execution in Oklahoma. If you are elected governor, will executions continue? Well, this is a subtle matter in Oklahoma. Uh, the voters made it very clear when they voted for the death penalty, and it is part of our Constitution, and I will uphold that. Uh, but it is important that we have a governor who actually does the due diligence uh, with that office, with those um, pardon and parole recommendations, uh, not seeking national headlines like we saw on one day uh, okay. when the governor um, didn't do his homework and who allowed a violent criminal, in fact, to leave. And that criminal, uh, along with, I, I don't know if he was, if, if he was too busy sowing division uh, from protecting families, but tell that to the family of Andrea Blankenship, who was murdered by a man that this governor let out on a record day of letting out many nonviolent offenders, and he did not do his homework. And he, Governor Stitt let this man out, and he killed two other people as well. Or ask the Michelle Powers family, who this governor released, signed to release uh, the crossbow killer of Tulsa, my hometown. And it wasn't until the media found out uh, that that was reversed. We need a governor who does his homework. Governor Stitt, 30 seconds rebuttal. Yeah, again, to the people out there, and, and what she just said uh, is simply not true. Uh, when we, we have re released their low-level uh, drug offenders, well, I signed the largest commutation in U.S. history back in 2019, Right now, we are leading the country in the lowest uh, recidivism rate. That means people going back into prison. I'm very proud of the record uh, that we've made make sense. We've been locking up people that we're mad at, uh, and now we need to do it with the people that we're afraid of. And so we, we're giving second chances to some folks, but for her to twist this like this, it's just really, really disgusting and bringing up something that horribly happened 
Uh, you know, there's people that get out of prison every single day, and we can't control when something bad's going to happen. And for you to use that as political games, that's super disappointing. And I know the people out there uh, think that's a, a cheap, cheap uh, shot. Well, let me say this real quick. We're talking about Lawrence Anderson, who was redocketed in error by the Pardon and Parole Board. This matter that's was right. investigated by the Oklahoma County Grand Jury. They alleged that there was improper influence. I don't know about that matter. What is your understanding of why Lawrence Anderson got redocketed and then got commuted? You know, there's thousands and thousands of people in, that, are, that are currently in prison, and they're going to be getting out this year uh, that have got certain sentences. And the Pardon and Parole Board goes through those the best they can. There's five people on that board, and they recommend for some people to get released. And sometimes bad things happen, and with thousands of people every year, the other thing is just throwing away the key and locking every single person up for good. That's not the solution either, uh, Superintendent. And so things are going to happen. And for you to take that type of shot and bring those wounds back up and try to make those families out there think that that was somehow uh, I was responsible or the five people on the pardon and parole board, uh, they absolutely would change their vote and make a different decision if we knew that that person was going to kill someone. Everybody out there knows that. We all know that you're just trying to make political points. That's disgusting. 30 seconds, Superintendent. Yes. So, Real quick, let's, let's keep the pause down. Thank so you. So let's talk about the facts. The fact is the rates of violent crime are higher in Oklahoma under true. your watch than it's in New true. York and California. That's a fact. Well, we'll have that oh fact checked gosh. by the Frontier <laughs> Superintendent. It's also a fact that medical Hang on, marijuana... Hang Oklahomans, do you believe we have higher crime than New York or California? That's what she just said. Safety and security is my top priority, and it will be as governor. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, Storm, you have it for Governor Stitt also. Yes. Uh, thanks to legislation you signed as governor, abortion is now categorically illegal in Oklahoma, except when a woman's life is in jeopardy. If a woman or underage girl is raped or is struggling with severe chemical addiction, she is criminally prohibited from terminating a pregnancy in Oklahoma. If one were to be passed by the legislature, would you sign a law allowing abortion in cases of rape, incest, or when a woman is entering rehab for a chemical addiction? 60 seconds. You know, as a, as a father of three daughters, just unimaginable pain, and I can't imagine uh, if, if something like that would have happened. You know, we, we believe that life begins exception in Oklahoma. Um, we, we, there are exceptions in our law that we're going to leave up to the health care professions. Uh, but I think we want to be number one in, in caring for the mother and the child in Oklahoma. Uh, we we want to be number one in adoption rates. Uh, but I think the most extreme view here is my opponents and her party, and she won't actually answer it. Uh, but there's states like Colorado and California and New York that will abort babies all the way up until the time of birth. They're more aligned with North Korea and China. Even France bans abortion at 14 weeks. You won't hear her give an answer. I'm very clear on my pro-life stance in Oklahoma, and I would like to know is she going to side with the Biden party and allow abortions all the way up until the time of birth? We are going to hear from Superintendent Hoffmeister, but speaking of being very clear, would you sign an exception for rape, incest, or addiction? You know, if the legislature put that on my desk, I would sign that. Okay. Superintendent Hoffmeister, 60, 60 seconds. And also, when it comes to abortion, how would you work with the Republican legislature on that? The women of Oklahoma have heard you loud and clear. All right? And let me tell you, that we have a governor who has shown no mercy for victims of rape or incest. He has signed and invited the most extreme ban on abortion in this country. I am personally pro-life, but I haven't walked in every woman's shoes. I don't favor extremes on either side of this issue. This is a health care decision between a woman and her doctor and her faith. We need to repeal what the governor has done. He has criminalized health care. He has criminalized standard medical care. He has assaulted women and doctors. And when he was confronted by a rape victim who said, Governor, what would you do to help me? He had no answer. He had no help. 
I, am gonna I let, will. I am going to let the governor... <laughs> We're going to let Governor Stitt respond to that, but Superintendent Hoffmeister, you mentioned repealing the abortion laws. Those passed with overwhelming support in the legislature. How do you do that? Are you willing to veto the budget? What leverage do you have on abortion? Superintendent, because yes. Because of the clapping, I'm sorry. Did, did you direct that at yes, me? Um, yes. You, you so, mentioned... Re yeah. Yes. Um, we have a supermajority Republican House and Senate. Politics is about relationships. And I have worked with many of our Republican and Democratic-led uh, elected leaders in the House and Senate. And there are many who have worked to advance issues that their communities want, and we do the hard work of building consensus, uh, of bringing people together and leading. This governor fights with the legislature uh, instead of saying, all right, let's come together. What are yeah. your top priorities? These are the things that are going to be a no-go. I'm going to be a Thank backstop you. to some of that as well, but we will work together to get things done for the people of Oklahoma. Thank you, Superintendent. Governor, 15 more seconds on abortion if you'd like. Again, to the people out there, I'm very clear that I believe that life begins at conception, and we don't even know where our, my opponent stands on it. Uh, again, she stands with the most extreme of her party, and they will not say, when is it too late to take a human life? They don't know. They won't tell you. I can Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Excuse Ten me. seconds. Ten hard I continue seconds. to hear a theme with Kevin Stitt. It's all about party. Do you hear it? <laughs> it's about truth. This is, what is it's about, about people answers. for me. Excuse me. This is about people over party. This is about Oklahomans. This is about the real issues facing Oklahoma today. I am going to fight like hell for the future of this state, and I don't care. I'll hold both parties accountable. We're going to do what's right for Oklahomans, and that is why I'm running for office. All right, thank you very much. That's the, uh, that's, let's take a round of applause for them so far in the race. We're running behind like mad, so we're going to jump into education. Storm, you have another toss-up question for the candidates. We are very behind, so please try to mind that stop sign and forgive us if we get a little rude here with the time. Let's talk about uh, the apparent alleged criminal mess that's become Epic Charter Schools and its founders, private management company, Youth Epic Youth Services. This is a toss-up, so whoever wants to take it first for 90 seconds. Ben Harris and David Cheney were some of Oklahoma's most prominent political donors for years. Governor Stitt, they donated 2700 bucks to your 2018 campaign. Superintendent Hoffmeister each donated more than 8000 to your 2018 campaign. Now they both face uh, embezzlement charges, and the two of you have blamed each other for the epic saga. So without further ado, uh, who's to blame and what went wrong with Epic. 60 seconds, whoever wants to start. Well, when I came into office, she had already been there for four years. Just so everybody out there knows, she was a Republican and she was the superintendent of education four years before I got there. Took up to $50,000. When I first got there, I knew there was a problem. I called for an audit. Then she signed on to my audit. She could have done it before I got there. I returned, when they got indicted, I returned all of my uh, campaign donations, I think 2,700 you said, I don't remember exactly what the number was. My opponent has still not returned over $50,000 that she received from them. Uh, she was in charge of that. We have to hold people accountable. That's what I've been doing. I've called for more audits to be more transparent with your taxpayer dollars. That's the reason we have the largest savings account we've ever had in state history. We're ranked fourth in the country in that, by the way. And we will continue to hold government accountable as long as I'm governor. I'm putting a fresh set of eyes on every single thing. And when I called for the audit of the education department that she runs, it's the largest spend in taxpayer dollars, she called it an attack. Oklahomans, I call it transparency, and so do you. So I think she needs to answer, why would she call an audit of the education department an attack, and why didn't she do an audit before I even got into office? Superintendent, I think we had 90 seconds on EPIC. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a governor who stood in the way and protected his donors. That's the difference between the governor and me. I held donors accountable. And we saw this governor shield them. In fact, his own state board members were reluctant and refused to accept the audit findings of the state auditor. 
When she said, you must claw back a true. certain amount of money, it is true. Their answer was, let's audit the auditor. And we had to spend about 10, 11 more months going through every single transaction to audit the auditor. And then only at that point, well, wait, let me back up. It gets better. When I called for probation for Epic, his board refused. They refused to hold them accountable. And it was, again, a second call after, after we saw a change in leadership, but they still had friends and allies on that board and they would not do it until those people were gone. Here's the bottom line. We have a governor who knows the State Department of Education needs subpoena power. They have refused it. We have seen the um, epic scandal turn into putting profit over kids. We Thank have you. called for change, and this governor has stood in the way and protected donors. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on very quickly to uh, school choice questions. Uh, those of you, probably everybody knows there was a push in the legislature last year for Education Empowerment Acts. People call them vouchers uh, to help people go to private schools. Uh, Governor Stitt, what do you tell rural educators and parents who see school choice rhetoric like that and vouchers as a threat to their district's local funding? 60 seconds. Well, thank you. First off, to, to everybody out there watching on TV, the ads that her campaign and her special interest groups have been running against me to try to deceive and lie, you, lie to you and create chaos and say that I'm going to defund your rural schools, it's, it's absolutely untrue. I have put more money in education than any other governor in history. That's a fact. More money in education. We just passed the Redbud bill, which would actually put more money into our rural schools. We passed a bill to pay teachers up to $100,000 a year. And folks, I know that education is the most important thing to all of us to make sure our kids have the right education. But at the same time, we're going we're gonna to think outside the box. And I'm going to stand with parents over big unions. My opponent shut down schools for over a year. Folks, we will work like crazy to make sure we have the best teachers in the classroom teaching your young people, and we will fund our rural schools. And for them to send out mailers and lie to you, it's just disgusting. Well, what's disgusting is a governor who presents his own argument as fact, and it's not. Here's the truth. This governor says just now that um, he's going to preserve rural Oklahoma. But we all know that his voucher scheme is a rural school killer. You kill the school, you kill the community. And frankly, it'll be epic on steroids. And we won't get that money back. And we also know that you kill the community in rural Oklahoma, and I've passed through those communities where their school's gone. So is the community. So is the town. And soon, the regional hospitals. This matters. If we are going to see Oklahoma thrive, we have to have a vibrant, growing rural communities. And we will not have that under your watch. You have promised that you will bring vouchers in if you are reelected. And you will see the dismantling of public schools. We will never be able to meet the workforce needs of business and industry. Uh, it is a no-go with me, and that is clear. I stand with rural Oklahoma. Thank you very much. Storm, next question. All right, we're going to move to another important topic, the jurisdictional challenges and questions in eastern Oklahoma that have sent from the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in McGirt v. Oklahoma. This question will first go to Superintendent Hoffmeister. That decision affirmed the Indian Country Reservations of the Muskogee, Creek, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, and Quapaw Nations. Superintendent Hoffmeister, you have been endorsed by the leaders of the five tribes, so we're curious to know your interpretation of the McGirt decision's impacts. Do you believe the McGirt decision only applies to criminal jurisdiction, or does it go to places like civil law, environmental regulations, and notably taxation? 60 seconds. We are in a mess of the governor's making with McGirt. Obviously, the ruling came, and we saw a governor who did not work immediately to secure uh, those communities all across uh, those six affected tribes and work together 
to establish a compact that would address uh, cross-jurisdiction or cross-deputization where we can ensure that we are keeping everyone safe in these criminal matters. Instead, what this governor has done is what he does with a lot of things. He is sowing chaos and division, and that division is pitting neighbor against neighbor. This does not help us. Let's stop and think for a moment. Our sovereign tribal nations represent a $15.5 billion economic impact a year to the state. Collectively, they are the largest employer in the state, but this governor burned bridges before McGirt, and then he had nothing to walk back over when it was time to keep Oklahomans safe. Superintendent, do you believe McGirt applies to civil matters, environmental regulations, and taxation? That is a matter that is going to require work together, and we know it's being litigated right now. Yes not or no. all the what tribes, you... no, that's not a yes or no answer because those are different tribes that all have a different view on this. You collectively lump people together. That is not the kind of leader that understands that we have 39 unique tr sovereign tribal nations in this state, and they don't speak with one voice. In fact, the historic moment was when they stood up and said, you must go. Governor, 90 seconds. Do you believe that McGurr applies to civil law applications and why have your administration spent so much state money fighting these battles in yeah, court? Th this is great for everybody out there watching on TV because this is a clear difference between me and my opponent. Uh, you know, the McGurt decision was a federalization of all of eastern Oklahoma. Basically, the Biden administration now in charge of eastern Oklahoma. Uh, that's what that was. And we're for fairness. We're for equal protection under the law. I don't believe because of race or heritage you should have different punishments, uh, different uh, uh, we should all be Oklahomans, in other words. And right now, the answer is very clear. Absolutely not. It shouldn't go into civil or taxation. As a matter of fact, the tax commission just released a statement that said, of course, everybody has to pay taxes in Oklahoma. Can you imagine a CEO of a bank in eastern Oklahoma not paying taxes, but a single mom of a different race does? It's not a hard question. We're either all Oklahomans under the same set of laws, or we have a bunch of jurisdictions. She can't even answer that simple question. Is she for Oklahoma, or is she for a, a scatterboard of jurisdictions in eastern Oklahoma? And would, I can answer gonna, that. We're going to stick with tribal well, relations. Yeah, I, I want to ask Governor Sitter just one thing. Just to be clear, it would have to be a bank that is owned by a tribal nation, right? What, no, the CEO of, uh, of any bank or the, any believe, tribal member. There were 9,000 cases before the state's tax commission that were just, maybe they worked at Quick Trip, or they worked at uh, Williams, or they worked for this company, that were saying they don't have to pay state taxes. It's, I, it's like I'm in a twilight zone. How would you like Joe Neighbor here and Joe Neighbor here? One is, we all go to the same high schools, we drive on the same roads, and one doesn't play by the same set of rules as you have to. It's preposterous. But it would be their income that's derived from a tribal no, controlled source. No, no. I believe it's that's what the everything state code, code no. says. What they were asking for is anything in eastern Oklahoma uh, because that was what was federalized after McGirt under what's called a reservation. Well, we'll fact check that. Thank you to the Frontier for that. I could pull the link up on my phone. I read it the other day. Uh, we have the next question, Governor Stitt. I had the opportunity to speak with the Actually, 15 hard seconds. We have to be able to have a governor who understands and respects the tribal sovereignty of the 39 sovereign nations in this state. We do not have that, and you heard it with this answer. And the second thing is, we have to do the hard work. There can be a win-win, but it takes work. With Governor Stitt, there's always a loser. Governor Stitt, 15 yeah. hard seconds. Do you, yeah. do you believe in tribal sovereignty for the 39 tribes? Well, here's the deal. I'm actually a member of the Cherokee Nation. I'm proud of our heritage. We've got an open-door policy, have lots of great friends that are tribal members. Uh, so, again, yes, we all want to work together. But does that mean that I don't believe in Oklahoma's rule of law and the district attorneys in Tulsa being able to prosecute all crimes the same? That actually protects tribal members. Talk to the police and the law enforcement, the lawlessness going on. Uh, 
we have to have one set of rules. It's, it's, it's common sense. I don't understand why people don't get that. Well, let me ask you just again, yes or no. I gave her a yes or no, yes or no to you. Do you believe in and respect and acknowledge the tribal sovereignty of those tribes? The, the, the federal government calls it domestic dependent sovereigns. And so absolutely, yes, uh, they have sovereignty uh, over um, what they have sovereignty over. Uh, it's a confusing question for all of us. Um, but the, the Castro case that we won basically said that, yes, you have land, but it's still inside the borders of the state of Oklahoma. That's a big question. Are we Oklahomans or we have six different jurisdictions? Uh, I think this is a very important question for people at home to understand the differences between you, uh, my opponent and I. Well, that's why we're asking about it, and I've got a question for you, sir. I had the opportunity to speak with the leaders of the five tribes just the other day, and I asked them, what question would you ask? Uh, if you were me of Governor Stitt, and they all basically had the same thing to say. They said, when are you going to sit down with them and have actual meaningful conversations to find common ground and rebuild your administration's strained relationship with tribes and tribal citizens? When's that going to happen? T tomorrow, tomorrow at 10 o'clock. They're all on TV watching right now. Let's do it tomorrow at, at 10 o'clock at, at the my office. Governor's Mansion or? No, no, at the, at the State Capitol. Edmund or? At the State Capitol, right in their conference okay. room. The, okay. The, the fact, that, the fact that people say that we're not willing to talk is simply untrue. We've got people all the time reaching out behind the scenes, talking to one another. Uh, and, and for, you know, I think I represent, you know, Oklahomans as a tribal member and a fourth generation Oklahoman. Uh, I'll tell you this, most tribal members I know are pretty independent and we don't like big bosses telling us what to do or who to vote for. Uh, let Storm and I know when that meeting happens, we'll be there. We don't have to record it, but we'd like to see it happen. Okay, uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister, 60 seconds, same question to you. When would you have those conversations, and what specific priorities would you have regarding those topics? When I take over uh, and win this election and step into office, uh, it's triage. And one of the first things that we're going to have to work to restore is the compacts. Uh, around McGirt. I will work with our new Attorney General to do that and we will uh, build on the trust and the respect that I've established. Let me say this to every member of a sovereign tribe in Oklahoma. I will not betray the trust we've established. We can have a win-win and we can do what is right for all Oklahomans and we know that it takes a will to actually come together and do hard work that we're not going to be able to accomplish in a 60-second answer. But this is the kind of work that requires a leader who can unite people around common ground. Every one of those sovereign nations wants education for their kids, safe and healthy communities, and the infrastructure for great jobs, and we are missing out on building partnerships and growing together government to government. Thank you. you yeah, five sec it. Ten and, seconds. Yeah, sure. And, and Oklahomans, you heard it right there. That is so important. She is for federalizing eastern Oklahoma. So no longer would the state be in control if she was governor. I don't think anybody wants that. Ten seconds, Superintendent. It's breathtaking the way the governor processes this and sees it. Okay? <laughs> All right, on that note, let's go to the end of round two. Thank you so much. We're heading into round three. Somebody get me a drink ready back there. Okay, our final round is titled Burnt Ends, and we're going to ask each candidate questions regarding their records and backgrounds. 90-second answers for the round with the person asked the question, concluding with a third and final statement of 45 seconds. Storm, you have the first question for Governor Stitt. All right, Governor Stitt, in your 2019 State of the State address, you said lawmakers granting the governor hiring and firing authority over state agencies would ensure government is held accountable you said, quote, you know exactly where the buck stops at my desk, end quote. Earlier this year, embattled tourism director Jerry Winchester resigned after a legislative committee found the tourism department overpaid Swadley's Foggy Bottom Kitchen by $17 million. The state is now suing the restaurant for allegedly overcharging for construction costs of state park restaurants, something Swadley's denies. The question, Governor, under your own logic from 2019, does the buck stop at your desk for the Swadley's barbecue scandal? And is there anything you would have done differently in retrospect? Again, the facts you just said are, are not true, and that's misleading to Oklahomans. 
Uh, we have six restaurants across the state. I think Jerry Winchester is a fantastic. Which facts were incorrect? The sev- the, that we've lost $17 million. That's simply not true. Uh, if there's, it's like if you build a home and you hire a contractor to build that home, and then you say the contractor overcharged you for this sheetrock or, or this piece of equipment, that's what we're talking about here. If the vendor overcharged us, then we've already, there's lawsuits against that vendor. But to say that the taxpayers lost $17 million is untrue. There's six restaurants and parks across the state right now that we're going to get a new vendor. There's an RFP process in place. There'll be a new vendor that'll open those up, and we will operate those. The state owns all that. There's 4,600 vendors uh, that participate with the state of Oklahoma, and if we find out any vendor's doing things wrong, we're going to hold them accountable. Folks, we will be transparent with your dollars. That's why we've built this largest savings account. That's why we're holding government accountable. Uh, So, yes... Uh, we will hold these vendors accountable. But to say that we've lost $17 million is simply not true. The tourism department does their, their best job. There's about 500 employees there that are working hard for Oklahomans to make our parks top 10. And for political purposes, these folks take shots at these, at these uh, uh, good, hardworking Oklahomans that stepped away from private careers to go serve their state. And I just think it's unfair, and it's all politics. You notice it all pops up on an election year. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's from uh, my opponent uh, who likes to uh, kind of deceive people out there in the public. And I just wanted them to hear directly from me on that. Well, Thank Storm, you. You, do you want to take this or should I? Because I, I, I don't think he said, the script says overpaid. It didn't say anybody lost it. I understand that there's an ability to claw back that money, but you're saying that Jerry Winchester did fantastic work and that this went well? I mean, what, uh, what, what do you think about what Brent Swadley is accused of doing? <laughs> Again, if the vendors are doing anything wrong and overcharging the state, uh, Oklahomans want somebody to put a fresh set of eyes on every single contract. That's what we're doing. And when we found out that there's any overcharging, and it's a current lawsuit going on, we're going to hold those vendors accountable. But for you to throw out the numbers about $17 that's simply not true. Uh, that's That's not the number that was overcharged by that vendor if there was a number. Superintendent Hoffmeister, 90 second rebuttal. The governor repeated Harry Truman when he said the buck stops with me at his state of the state. But what we have clearly seen is the governor plays past the buck. This is a governor who has squandered, mismanaged, and lost millions of taxpayer dollars on his watch with his appointees. Uh, Let's just talk about those facts. State Auditor in 2021 shows $41 million in questioned costs among governor's agencies that he has control over. $20 million in missing PPE inventory paid for, never received. $12 million lost in Swadley's scandal. Can't even trust you with barbecue. (laughs) Governor Stitt, 45 seconds to close it to you. Again, there's a, there's a $25 billion budget. We have 30,000 hardworking employees in the state of Oklahoma, 4,600 vendors. I think Oklahomans are smart enough to know that if there's a vendor overcharging us, uh, there's lawsuits, and we're going to claw back that money, and we're going to protect the taxpayers. Nobody fights for the taxpayers more than I do. I want lower taxes. We have the largest savings account. She's never met a tax she didn't like. She wants to tax and spend and try to confuse Oklahomans for the momentum that we're getting. Okay. Thank you very much. I have to correct that. That is a falsehood. I have never proposed any kind of misuse of taxpayer dollars. We have been transparent. And I believe that we have to hold our elected leaders accountable for those tax dollars they were entrusted with that they misused. We have the gear funds, which was given to all governors. And this governor has 31 million of the 39 million with questionable expenditures, lacks uh, control systems, um, 30 million for a do nothing pandemic center. 
And we also know that we have seen this governor had 80% of those expenditures fed that were given through gear. Thank you. Superintendent, thank you very much. You've had the most time for a while. Uh, governor Stitt, he, she mentioned gear funds. Let's go there. 15 seconds, 30 seconds. What do you need? Yeah, again. Tell uh, us what happened because people said that that was not overseen well. Yeah, again, uh, during, during um, the pandemic, the Trump administration, uh, actually Bessie DeVos, gave $39 million to the governors. Uh, she gave $680 million to the public school system. Uh, so the real question Oklahomans want to know is, with that $680 million, why could you not keep two of the largest school districts open? I was fighting for parents in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, that were their schools were closed for 355 days every single day i would have parents call me just saying governor my first grader is not learning how to read via zoom can you help us thank you and that's why i was focused so hard people are waking up to the learning loss now i think the people deserve to know why you closed the schools for that long thank you very much uh Last week, the Frontier reported the super PACs and dark money groups have spent more than $12.5 million attacking Governor Stitt and supporting you this election cycle, which is more money than both of your campaigns have spent combined. You and others were arrested and charged related to dark money coordination in your 2014 campaign. Those charges were ultimately dropped. But with dark money again flooding the airwaves and billboards and mailers to support you from sources that do not have to reveal their donors, how can Oklahomans trust that you'll work for them and not unnamed folks who are running dark money campaigns. Because I stand up to those who are mishandling the taxpayer dollars. I stand up for our schools. I did that in my first race in 2014, and an underhanded politician brought false charges. Those were dropped and expunged by the DA, and I am proud to have stood up for my uh, family, for our schools, for all of the families of Oklahoma. And this is a governor who wants to distract from his own record. It is his record that has led to many who want to see him out of office. I don't have a thing to do with anything but my campaign. And in our campaign, we are running on faith, family, education, hard work, Oklahoma values, and that's what we are talking about. That's what I will continue to focus on, and I will always stand up no, for the truth, no matter the cost. Uh, just real quick, who is the underhanded politician you referenced? My opponent, which I beat in oh, a three-way gotcha. and won 77 counties. Didn't those charges, oh, you mean the 2014 opponent? Yes. Okay, thank you. Governor Stitt, 90 seconds to you to respond to her statement? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a question we all want to know, and I know people at home want to know, uh, who's behind all these dark money ads? Uh, $20 million has been spent against me, attacking me, spreading lies and chaos and misinformation, supporting my opponent. I'll give you 20 million reasons why she will be beholding to special interest and not you, the people. Folks, I will always stand for 4 million Oklahomans. You elected me to put a fresh set of eyes on every agreement, every contract, hold government accountable. That's exactly what we're doing. The momentum is happening. Oklahoma, we're number 11 in people moving to our state. Our economy has never been more diverse and brighter with our aviation and defense and agriculture and all the great things that we're going. But it is a very, very interesting question. I would like my opponent to tell us who it is. We both know she knows who it is. We no. would like her to Actually, tell us who you are it is. Wrong. Super, and here's super and the people here's deserve the it. The people want to know, Joy. If there is a way to get money out of politics, sign me up. Because it is what has corrupted this state. Eight out of ten Oklahomans believe there is corruption in state government on your watch. And they are saying that they see your self-dealing, they see your cronyism, and I've had a front row seat to the corruption that I've witnessed under your watch. Oklahomans are sick of it. They want our state so to move true. forward in a way where we put people first. We don't read off a national script like this governor. Instead, we put people first, and that we are, are careful with their precious taxpayer dollars. There are people who are paying taxes today that can barely make it 
I have met with the seniors who are splitting pills and they have to drive 80 hours, I'm sorry, 80 miles to their doctor and they can't afford it and you've done nothing to help them other than empty promises and misspending their taxpayer dollars. I'm standing against it and Oklahomans are gonna hold you accountable on November the 8th. Thank you very much. I'm gonna, we got two more questions and then our closing statements. We're gonna to go to 60 second and then 30 second responses on this. Governor Stitt, uh, as governor, you've appointed two men to serve as the executive secretary of the commissioners of the land office, an obscure but incredibly important state agency that manages state land assets and distributes more than $100 million a year to local school districts. Both men have resigned. First, Brant Vodder left amid questions about his oil and gas company's legal battles with the CLO, as well as the revelation that he lacked the advanced degree required legally for the position to which you appointed him. Your next appointee, Elliot Chambers, resigned after it was revealed he had a prior relationship at a company he contracted with to manage state assets. Governor Stitt, why should Oklahomans reelect you to appoint a third CLO secretary? And what do you say to people who question your decision to move to some direct investments with that uh, money? Well, first off, uh, for, for people out there, the CLO is manages uh, the land that was given by the federal government at statehood. So that's what the CLO is. It's about a five billion dollar fund, and then we've got mineral interest. Uh, that we manage for the benefit of education. Uh, so that's what the fund is. And we need people that understand investments, that know how to invest $5 billion, people that have oil and gas backgrounds to maximize the profits for Oklahomans. And so that's what we do. We're going to try to find the best people. I don't play politics with people that we uh, try to put in these positions. We try to find the very, very best Oklahomans, and then we recruit them to leave their oil and gas jobs or their investing jobs to come serve the state. And I'm so proud of some of the Oklahomans that have come, came in and served. We've got great ones. And those that are watching on television, get involved. Uh, we need more good people involved in politics. We cannot leave politics or just the career politicians and people that just automatically flock around that, this building. We need you to come get involved. Oklahoma has a bright future. We have a lot of momentum going right now, and we'll continue with that effort to bring people from the outside. Thank you. Superintendent Hoffmeister, 60 seconds to you as well. You also serve on the Commissioners of the Land Office. You've been in the executive sessions to talk about these matters. What can you tell the public? So I will tell you, as a Commissioner of the Land Office, I am very troubled by what has happened under the Governor's watch. In fact, uh, whistleblowers came forward, multiple whistleblowers, and they came to me and I sent them to the state auditor. And we were both very troubled. I called for an agenda item so that we could bring the information forward. Uh, the, the CLO director, his secretary that he speaks of, um, fired that person and settled with that person then in 30 days. We have a governor who refused to actually hold accountable in a transparent way the secretary, I called for him to resign. He did, he resigned. But then I turned over what I was ready to share in executive session and the governor's attorney for the commission of land would not put it on the agenda in a legal way. And so those documents went to the DA who saw need to turn it over to the OSBI. So that matter, we will hold Oklahoma uh, taxpayers um, in a place where we are doing right by them and we will hold anyone who has acted improperly accountable. Thank you very much. Governor, 30 seconds response. You know, again, the, the people that are at the table, this was inside baseball that you're hearing here. People are concerned about education, health care. Let's actually talk about that. Inflation. Why are things costing more? It's the Biden administration, it's your record in education, and the people deserve to know, why are we, after eight years, somebody in poor performance? In Oklahoma, if you're doing poor performance, we don't give you a promotion. Storm, you've got the right. final question of the night. Our uh, final question before closing, uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister, thanks to the historic 2018 state tax increase, and rounds of federal COVID relief funding, there are significantly more public dollars devoted to Oklahoma's education system now than ever before. A year ago, Governor Stitt requested State Auditor and Inspector Cindy Byrd conduct a full audit of the State Department of Education 
to identify all revenue sources and determine if the agency and local school districts are complying with all financial reporting requirements. As was mentioned earlier this evening, you called the governor's request an attack on Oklahoma's education system. But during your time leading the agency, we have seen several instances where public funding has been misused from EPIC to Seaworth Academy, child nutrition program funding, and federal E-rate fraud, just to name a few. The question, why would you not welcome Auditor Byrd's pending report on how education dollars are being spent in Oklahoma? Well, that is because the governor doesn't understand at all what he asked for. Um, these are all serious issues, which we've held Oklahoma schools, charter schools, uh, and those at Epic accountable. And I've clawed back the money, but here's the deal. The governor wants you to believe that the State Department of Education has never been audited. Since I've been in office, we've had probably 25 at least audits. We pay $400,000 a year to the state auditor for those audits, and his audit is now going to be over $100,000 to do something that is an exercise in actually going into the schools at a time where they are dealing with COVID recovery. He talks about closing schools. I'm the one who stood up for local control I'm the one who wrote a hundred page document called Return to Learn so that our kids would get back in school. He's the one who actually closed this state. He closed our businesses, Thank he you. closed our restaurants, and he allowed our COVID, mis uh, our hospitals to surge under a COVID that was raging and has impacted our children's learning. Thank you. 90 seconds, Governor. Well, I mean, Again, Oklahomans uh, are out there. They do want to know why was she calling the audit an attack? Uh, there's a difference between financial audits and performance audits. And the facts are a governor had never called for an audit of public education until I did it. That's the largest tax spend of your taxpayer dollars. We spent $3.2 billion uh, in our public education system. It's the record we've ever we've spent. Uh, no governor's ever spent more. Uh, and that doesn't include the ad valorem dollars. So yes, we want to be transparent. This is the first time it's ever done. But yes, there are financial, uh, there's financial audits, but there, but there is a difference there. Um, but, you know, if we get back to the issues, what people are wanting to talk about, which she hasn't told you one thing, Oklahomans, why are we 49th in test scores? Why does Florida, who spends less per pupil than Oklahoma, and their test scores on the NAOPs are 17? What are they doing differently? As a leader, as a business person, we're gonna challenge ourselves and we're gonna look at other states. There's no reason Oklahoma's not a top 10 state. We should be top 10 at everything that we do. We live in the greatest state in the country. I've grown a business here. We can do it. We can do better for our kids. That's what I'm fighting for. That's why I ran last time. That's why I left my company to come serve my state and focus on the next generation. And that's what I promised Oklahomans that I would do uh, this time. Our momentum is halfway there. Folks, we want to keep it going. We do not want to go backwards to a Biden party in control of Oklahoma. Uh, Superintendent, 45 seconds to button up uh, education here. I'm sorry, say. Yes, 45 seconds before we move on to closings. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm not sure where you get all of your information, but I will tell you we are 46th lowest in the nation in what we invest in the children of Oklahoma compared to other states. We are no longer uh, at the top of the region in being competitive, paying market. I am also a businesswoman. I know what that means. That means that you have to invest in people. If we're going to meet the needs of children and see higher outcomes, we have to have teachers, in school buildings, but not just a classroom teacher. We need to have more people on the team to support our kids' learning. School counselors, we need reading specialists, we need paraprofessionals, special education teachers. We need all of the people on the team that are gonna be able to help our children meet and overcome their needs and barriers. And it is pitiful that we have a governor who doesn't get that connection, that we have to meet their needs, whether those needs are um, are about 
the people or about the resources um, with just even getting to the school. We know that this governor is standing in the way, and he is not the kind of governor that is going to put people first. With him, it's always politics first. Thank you very much. Let's go right on to 90-second closing statements. Governor Stitt, you have the first 90-second closing statement. Well, thank you so much for joining in tonight. We really, really appreciate it. And, and I like to remind people how far we have come in the last four years. You know, when I took over from budget deficits to now record savings and surplus to four-day school weeks and teacher walkouts to now record investments in schools and teachers, a very bright economy. We're attracting companies and, and people from all over the country and really all over the world. You know, friends, my opponent, she joined Joe Biden's party when she couldn't see a path forward for herself as a Republican. But it, it's no surprise, she closed schools for weeks in 2018, then she joined liberal unions to close our schools in 2020 for almost a year. Folks, Oklahoma's turnaround that you elected me to do, it is working. We've got a lot of momentum. We don't wanna go backwards. But there are special interest groups that have lost control of the Capitol, they don't like it. They have spent $20 million on lies and confusion and chaos, attacking me and promoting her. And I'll give you 20 million reasons why she will never be beholden to the people of Oklahoma. She'll be beholden to special interest groups. And folks, I wanna keep the momentum going. We've got, balanced our budget. We gave teachers a pay raise, law enforcement a pay raise, all while cutting taxes for Oklahomans. Thank you so much for being here, and let's go win this thing on November 8th. Thank you very much. Superintendent Hoffmeister, 90 seconds to close us out. All right, Oklahoman, Oklahomans, I'm gonna talk direct to you. Oklahoma is at a tipping point. We have a governor who has run our state into the ground through his self-dealing, through his cronyism and corruption, and I've had a front row seat. Education is on the ballot. Our rural communities are on the ballot. Freedom is on the ballot to make decisions for yourself and your trusted doctor. This governor wants to privatize education. It is going to kill our rural communities. This governor wants to privatize health care, sooner care. We're 20, we're, I'm sorry, 53% of enrollees are children. He wouldn't stand for a corporation getting in between his decisions, right? None of us want to have someone else in the way of making those life-changing decisions with medical care and a trusted doctor. We need the infrastructure for great jobs, and it is going to take a modern infrastructure plan so that this state can have world-class schools, safe and healthy communities, and the infrastructure for great jobs, and that includes relationships, partnerships with our sovereign tribal nations, with that $15.5 billion economic impact. Let's see our communities grow and thrive as partners, partners with nonprofits. All of this is about common sense, respect for one another, working together. And I say, I'm aggressively moderate. Meet me in the middle. Let's get things, something done for the people of Oklahoma. I'm asking for your vote on November the 8th. Oklahoma belongs to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes tonight's debate. Thank you to the candidates. Thank you to our sponsors, State Chamber. Thank you very much, Chad. Really appreciate your support. Storm, thank you. News 9, the Frontier, C-SPAN, all of our forts. Start that music, Stuart. Election Day is November 8th. Tip your bartenders well. They are great. I know them personally. They work hard. Thank you.